It's the holiday season. And look, I got you guys a gift. What better way to spread the holiday joy and cheer than to talk about people dying? Yep, I'm finally revealing the death order because you guys care for some reason. Some of you care. I don't know about all of you, but some of you do. I, I like get comments every once in a while. And here I am actually doing it. I'd highly recommend watching the Rocky Restart's cancellation video. Um, do I highly recommend it? I think I do. That has context, cause then you could, cause in that I over exaggerate how much I hate this. All the actually, no, I under exaggerate actually, because I reread it all, and it's so much worse. Oh my god. I didn't know. I, I was already saying it was the worst thing ever back then, and then I reread it. Yeah, I'm re-recording the beginning of this video right now, so r right about at this point, there's going to be a massive drop in energy, because, like, at the end of recording this, I just was like, okay, it's nearly done. I'm hyper for some reason. Why am I telling you this? Shut the f- If you didn't have a very good holiday time, I hope this is a nice little surprise for you. And if you did have a very good holiday time, I hope this ruins it. If you're watching this later and it's nowhere near Christmas, then I don't want you here. Go away. Wait until next Christmas, goddamn. And your present back to me is that I blast this video with ads and you give me ad money. Oh my god, thank you! You're too kind! Now onto the actual point of this video, the death order. Yeah, when I first came up with this idea, I was like, holy shit, this is the perfect time to do this. And then I started making the Google Doc. Ew! Because of that, the Google Doc took a... a little bit longer to write than I expected. But it's done. And now I have two days to do this. And I'm recording this on the night of the first day. So there's like one day left. Oh my. Because of that, this video will be, uh... Going into way less detail, it's basically just a quick recounting of the story with no rambling on random trivia and some goofy visuals or something, while the doc goes into a ton of detail. Too much detail. Check the description for that. Alright, quickly now, I have one day to do this basically. Also, major spoilers for every- for literally everything. Duh. So you know how the prologue went, hopefully. Everyone wakes up on a bus without memories, comically long introduction sequence with comically short intros, Monokuma shows up and does nothing, Kim cries, and the prologue ends. I'm also going to be giving advice on how to run a fangin in this video, now that I have a lot of experience. And for one, don't be afraid to space stuff out. Take your time. I shoved all the intros all into one place and it was freaking awful. Feel free to spread your intros out throughout the prologue. A few at the start, a few after the mascot shows themselves, a few near the end. You know, it's alright to deviate from how things usually go if it makes for better pacing. Think of your fangin' like writing a typical book, where you need to focus on pacing, what emotions your reader should be feeling, all that. It's easy to purely focus on the beats you have to hit to be a fangin' and not making an actually good story. I know that happened to me a lot, at least. Continuing, chapter 1 was basically, Glenn's scared of people and wants to live in the forest. He does that. Kim feels bad, he dies. Kim feels more bad and cries for a few hours. Turns out Autumn killed him to escape with Nora because she wants to fix her. <laughs> now chapter two. Everyone gets their secret revealed. Melody gets repeatedly bullied, unprompted. Emily has a mental breakdown because birthday. At said birthday, Melody is the candle. Okay, slow down, we're onto the new stuff. If you want to know pretty decently in depth how the trial was meant to go, how everyone figures everything out, then check the Google Doc in the description. Here, I'm just gonna say how the murder went down and then who our oh-so-evil killer is. So the killer seeing all the party stuff is like, oh, this is my time, and begins contemplating. First, the killer sets up the dresser trap, and there should be a cruddy diagram of it on screen right now. That's what Melody heard that one night when she was like, I heard a ghost. To set up this trap, the killer would have had to have bought a squirt gun and clock from Chinatsu, so that must, that must have been fun. They fill the squirt gun up with a bit of gasoline that Kim and Marcus brought. Then, the day of the party, the killer started the generator at a specific time with a specific amount of gas. That way, they could have it run out at the exact time they need. They set the alarm to go off at that same time and are sure to place candles near the area in easy reach, just in case anyone were to need a light source when they turn off the alarm. And that's all. Think this sounds like an easy murder to solve since it's so short? Maybe it is, I don't know, but the amount of math that's needed to be done in this case is just awful, and if Dennis didn't exist, then everyone would probably die. Now who actually did all this? 
Well... Dennis. Yeah, game show boy. Dennis didn't kill Melody because of the secrets motive. No, he killed Melody because of that little side thing Monokuma mentioned, of how he used up all the cast's money to fund the killing game. If that's the case, then Dennis's family could have been left homeless, and that's his worst fear. He's not a violent or evil person, though, so he tried to make the murder as easy for him mentally as possible. He chose a trap so that he wouldn't actually have to do anything himself, and he targeted Melody since she wasn't exactly the most appreciated person there by that point, so getting rid of her would lay less on his conscience, even though it made him feel even worse than it probably would have felt with anyone else. In the process of trying to come up with the most moral murder he could do, though, he ended up ruining Emily's birthday and giving Melody a horrifically painful, slow death. It really backfired. That made him feel really guilty, so to make up for it, he sort of, like, wanted to help out during the trial, which cost him his life, but it made him feel better, so... It could have been a really sad trial, I think, especially in contrast with Autumn, who is a very sympathetic killer, as you guys know. You you're stupid. As for Dennis's execution, I have written it, mostly. My composer of the new orchestra made the great track for it that'll be playing in the background, and the note the concept artwork drawn by the wonderful Von Creep. Thanks, bitch. It starts out nice. Monokuma asking Dennis difficult trivia questions which he'd answer successfully with relative ease. With each question, he's forced to answer quicker. The audience of Monokuma is throwing things at him as they think he's cheating. Eventually, the questions reach a point where they're so fast, it's practically impossible to answer. And a question comes up that he'd struggle to answer. I never fully decided on the specifics of this question, something like, are you a terrible person? Since obviously he's feeling a lot of guilt and would want to answer yes, but thinking logically about the things he's done in his life, he'd want to say no. Either way, he takes too long to think about it and fails the question. The stuff the audience is throwing at him grows more dangerous. He grows more panicked and tries to run away. Monokuma, having planned for this, takes the prize car and chases after him with it, running him over. He slowly dies on the ground, injured by the car directly hitting him and the crowd continuing to throw stuff at him. Okay there, chapter 2's done. How underwhelming. Now to chapter 3. <laughs> this chapter really did not have much planned. I'll just say the basic gist of it, the deaths, and then if you want any more info you can check the Google Doc. Oh, unused art asset intermission time. So this chapter starts out with everyone coping from the last chapter. Monokuma reveals that the killing game is going to have to be put on slight hold due to a storm that's going to pass over the camp. Although he does open up a new area. It's a mountain hiking trail which features a firewatch tower and all that good stuff. The cast takes shelter in either the diner or the trial cave. I never decided which and reinforce it with the plans of waiting the storm out. Monokuma would be with them the entire chapter, so that would have been fun. <laughs> Anyways, the storm starts and for some reason, the power goes out. Not wanting to be stuck in the dark for days, the group decides to send a few people out. I never decided who. The people that are sent out don't come back, so more people go out to search for them. Keep in mind that this is over the course of a few days. Everyone has their own reasons for going out, like Angela, who wants to prove herself as someone the group can rely on due to recent insecurities, or Emily going out because she thinks being in a storm would be fun. <laughs> Anyways, eventually everyone's out and missing besides Kim, Alexander, Nora, Victor, and Jesse. By that point, Alexander's actually cooperating and being nicer to Kim since he feels bad for how everyone treated Melody and took it a, as a bit of a reality check. And Kim's just being tortured because she's like, holy shit, everyone's outside and we're all and they're, they're all dead and we're not doing anything. Also, Victor suddenly remembers something, but he won't tell anyone because he's even more of an asshole than he was the last chapter. Eventually, the fear is just too much and Kim decides to go out on her own, thinking her athleticism could give her an advantage. It doesn't, she nearly died. Oh no! Literally being knocked off the side of a mountain and dangling for her life, but Alexander finally decides to be useful and relevant and grabs Kim, revealing the HOLY SHIT HE'S A ROBOT ARM! Anyways, I never fully decided what happens after that. Probably imagining to find the watchtower which would be where they find a few people hiding out, and discover that the whole electricity grid thing is destroyed so like, no more electricity for them. Slowly over time, more people are found, most having pretty bad injuries from the storm, until they find something. 
a pink slipper. Following that, they come to discover some sort of building. I never decided which building, but outside of that building is the corpse of... Hunter. The poor boy's been killed gruesomely. I never really decided on exactly how, I only decided his cause of death in the original version of this chapter, so... Very sad. Anyways, continuing on inside the mystery building, the cast finds the corpse of... Angela in a similarly gruesome state. No! Ah, uh, my poor girl. She didn't deserve any of this. Again, never fully decided on the cause of death for this version, but I do know it would have been obvious from the scene that she put up a big fight and likely survived for a good amount of time before succumbing to her wounds. Aww. Also, the reason the killer is allowed to kill three people in the rules is because in this original Chapter 3, the killer also targets Kim and she nearly falls off the cliff and dies. So there's that. So who's the killer? I don't exactly have a case to talk about since I never made it, so I'll just tell you who it is and their motive. So the killer of Angela Lavelle and Hunter Murphy is none other than... Fang and Tip are paying as their character seriously helps develop them and makes them easier to write. If you haven't tried it, maybe try it. Find a nice RP group. There's usually people promoting their RPs in Fang and Server promo channels. Okay. Anyways, the killer is Marcus, that piece of sh- His motive would pretty much be that after the Chapter 2 trial, which he's very heavily suspected in, he develops a bit of a grudge against everyone. He already didn't care much for anyone, but that chapter got rid of any reason he had to try to survive with everyone, so he's just on his own. So Marcus tries to come up with the most logical murder he can, killing with facts and logic. With no motive this chapter, he figures that this is a great opportunity to make things more difficult since, with no motive, everyone's equally capable. And he realizes that committing murder in a dangerous situation like this storm would really complicate things for everyone. Why did he kill two people? To flex, pretty much. These dumbasses can't even kill one person while I'm over here about to kill two. The motive could still use a little refining, but honestly, I like it. He's just a cocky little goblin. Much better than his original motive, at least. Dude was originally a freaking yandere that was trying to kill Kim since she didn't accept his love letters. Not this. I mean, why did I do that? Why? <laughs> The execution firm was not fully mid, so I don't have much to say on that. I'll just say I'd have liked it to involve poetry and acid rain, since that was in his old execution and fits the storm scenario very well. Well, chapter 3's done. Marcus, Angela... Why the fuck did I write... I wrote Marcus twice. Hunter are officially dead. Bang and tip break! Don't be afraid to, like, mask your inability to do something with creativity. Is this a dumb tip? I don't know, all my tips blow. Oh, this just came in handy a few times. Like for example, drawing all the panels and programming for the closing argument game would take far too long and be way too difficult, so I just decided to do the killer replay thing. Just think of that when something gives you trouble. Don't be afraid to technically downgrade if it means your fangin's able to continue. People will still like it. Now on to chapter 4. How the hell do I even talk about chapter 4? This chapter's crap. It was never rewritten, so like, everything I'm about to talk about is its completely original draft. It starts out with Kim feeling traumatized about nearly dying the day before in the storm slash being victimized in the previous chapter, but then Monokuma's like, hey guys, pack up, we're going somewhere else. That somewhere else being a strange lakeside lodge at the end of the hiking trail. At said lodge, the lights turn off randomly for whatever reason, and there's no windows or clocks, so like, no one knows the time and they can't control the lights. This isn't the motive, it's just a weird gimmick. The group finds movies, they watch them, but some stay up a little too late and have their entire sleep schedules reversed somehow. So now there's like, groups of people sleeping on opposite schedules. Again, not the motive, just more weird chapter gimmicks. Speaking of which, Monokuma brings up the motive, but he decides not to tell anyone because it's too traumatizing or something. Eventually, the cast finds a box, and soon later a key. And when it's open, they find the entire Danganronpa series from Danganronpa 1 to Danganronpa 53. Danganronpa? Yeah. Q Danganronpa V4 cast reacts to Danganronpa V3 cast. Death? What the heck? Oh my god! Again, this chapter is rough. That would have probably been very painful. Marie also asks Monokuma why he still hasn't told them the motive since by now it's been a few days. And he tells her that it's so scary he doesn't want to traumatize them yet. 
But if someone kills before it's revealed, he'd have no reason to use it. That is, in fact, the stupid-ass motive. It's the fear of an upcoming motive, and it's not subtle. I don't think that motive is impossible. I think you could actually do that motive, like, I don't know how I do it, I wasn't gonna do it well, but you could. By now, Jesse's feeling just a little nicer since Angela's death messed him up, Victor is progressively getting meaner, and Alexander's just gone. Yeah, after around the midpoint in this chapter, Alexander simply locks himself in his room and says bye, which I definitely have not done before. But that doesn't last too long since one morning Monokuma's like, I was gonna reveal the motive, but someone's dead. They break into Alexander's room and find a note about him wanting to kill everyone to end the killing game, but n no body, so they keep searching. After long enough, they find his corpse locked in a cupboard, featuring completely original, not at all traced Emily. Well, I know there's at least one person out there that's sad about Alexander's death. They make great art too. Anyways, unlike Chapter 3, I do have some stuff to say about the actual case. Basically, Alexander planned on killing everyone and then himself to end the killing game, as with the new revelation that they're all very likely in a TV show, killing everyone would, ru would ruin whatever plans the people running it had. I have mixed feelings on this because it just... it really does not seem like an Alexander thing to do. He has He's had a... character development up to this point, or would have hopefully had, so... I guess it depends on that, but I don't think no character development would ever make him g commit a mass murder and then suicide just to end the killing game because he thinks that they're all gonna die anyways, I don't know. Back to the murder, unfortunately while attacking the first person, they managed to overpower him and hit him in self-defense, Smack him! but they seem to go a little too hard and kill the poor dude. I don't know why I said unfortunately there, I guess that's actually a fortunate thing that he didn't- he wasn't able to mass murder everyone, but I'm gonna leave that in there because that's kind of funny. So the killer then, not wanting to be a murderer, hides his body and cleans everything up with the intention that no one will ever find him, sealed away forever. And then they go lock his door in from the outside and pretend nothing ever happened. So who's Alexander's unfortunate failed victim and now killer? Well that is... Emily. Uh, this case would have been so sad. Super sad trial. Assuming I wrote it right, which yes I would have, bitch, have faith in me. Well yeah, Emily was practically forced into killing and the cast unwillingly make her pay the price for it. I haven't mentioned it yet, but slowly as the trials go on, Kim grows more independent and less reliant on Marie for everything. She might even do the killing replay for this case with Emily being fairly close to her by this point and all. So the execution, similar to Marcus, I don't really have an execution for her. There's a lot that I could do. It makes it tough to pin any one thing down. What I do know is I want it to involve a saw trap and decisions that could be seen as either selfless or dumb depending on what you think. Also, at the end of this trial, Victor would tell everyone that what he remembered in Chapter 3 was that he's the mastermind. What a shocker. Chapter 5, almost done. Did not have much made for this chapter's daily life, so this should be quick. So chapter 5, Monokuma explains that he's not enforcing the killing game anymore. So like, if everyone wanted to, they to just live there for the rest of their lives, they could. This makes literally no sense in the lore, but I never rewrote this, so you'll have to forever think this is the chapter 5 motive. Everyone's friggin' thrilled about this and becomes like, lethargic, besides Nora who's pissed about everyone suddenly not caring about anything. Everyone's also probably avoiding Victor, cause that boy ain't right. At some point in the chapter, they manage to get into Monokuma's lair, which is hidden behind the kitchen. They find a few things on some people's backstories, mainly pointing to the fact that there was some sort of sign up for the show there on. And they also find little files on everyone, and the one on Victor says his talent. Victor Moore is actually the ultimate director. Like movie director, so not, not like killing game director, I don't know. So there's that. Yep, moving on. Nora bullies everyone for getting all lethargic the whole chapter, and particularly Marie. Marie and Nora should have had a rivalry going on by now, so when Nora's constantly harassing her, Marie gets irritated and shoves her, but accidentally shoves her at a shower which shatters, so she's like, not good again. This would not have made it into the final thing, because this is kind of stupid. Sparta's weird. 
I could say that about most of the unreleased stuff. So I'll just continue. Samori immediately feels awful for like horribly wounding this woman. So she takes Nora to Chinatsu, who is a very responsible person. Um, yeah, Chinatsu takes Nora under her care. The next morning, when they go to check on Nora, she's just missing. And while they search for her, a random BDA plays. There's no body though, so like... They decide to ask about it and of course go to Chinatsu, and she basically tells them everything I had just talked about. Monokuma's was pissed off that Chinatsu gave them all evidence, so he blasts that woman off to space and forces the cast to, cast to search under a time limit. They fail this time limit. So that's just the fucking end of Chinatsu. She's been blasted off. Um, it's a strange death. So who killed our beloved, clearly not receiving any favoritism and more screen time Nora? The answer is... Chinatsu did, sorta. After Marie brought Ch Nora to Chinatsu, Chinatsu neglected to fix her wounds and so just let her die, and then painted her hand white and made it poke out of a pile of clothes so the cast would think it's a mannequin when they're really triggering a BDA. I actually don't hate this idea. But it's really dumb here. So since Marie did leave the killing blow on Nora, Monokuma is absolutely not giving Shinatsu the thrill of being an official killer, so he just names Marie the killer. Monokuma executes Marie. The cast thinks this is all very unfair, but they can't do anything. Which, I mean, it is. Marie does punt Monokuma, though, before her execution, so... There's that. So what is that execution? This one is actually fully planned. Again, music by the new orchestra, concept drawing by Von Creep. It starts with Marie lit up by the blue light of her computer. She's in a dark room. She can't leave the room and the computer seems to be live streaming her webcam. People are begging for her to give an apology and with it being the only thing she can really do, she starts writing one. People in the chat throw insults at her, talk shit about the killing game and the recent trial, all sorts of things. As she types, it turn, sort of turns into a lo-fi beat to type out an apology slash get executed slash be part of a killing game 2 video with the music reflecting that. It's meant to be a bit eerie. The shot not really changing, just her typing as the music plays and a new slowly lowering from above. The note she's trying to write seems pretty generic at first, but as she grows more worried, it almost gets more personal. Her apologizing to her parents for not being what they had hoped for, her apologizing to Nora for inadvertently killing her, apologizing to her audience for not being the old Murray, until eventually the noose wraps around her neck and, they, and it yanks her up, lifting her out of her seat. She dangles from the roof, trying to break free, the chat likely spamming, climb the rope, knowing you bitches, but she eventually suffocates. An eerie shot of her hanging body eliminates by the computer and it fade to black. Fang and tip, if you're making a game, a great plugin for dialogue systems is Fungus, assuming you're using Unity. Fungus is the reason Rocky Restarts exists. I freaking love Fungus. Yeah, it could have been a sad little trial. I still love Marie, and hopefully this won't be the last you see of her. Even though her character here kind of sucked, I really did not give her much of a distinct personality. Anyways, this sounds like a good time to mention. If you've ever left a variation of either of these three comments on any of my videos, I hope you have a wonderful life, a loving family, and an amazing job where you make lots of money. Back to the plot. Uh, and with chapter 5 over... Now we're on chapter 6. This weird ass chapter. It was in fact rewritten, and, well, I don't fully hate it. It's just very strange, and d it does not match any of the other chapters at all. You'll see. <laughs> oh, I don't give a fuck! Bitch, I swear to God. Basically, the cast is mega mega fuming from the injustice that was the previous chapter, and so we're all done with this stuff. They all go back into the Monokuma lair and look for more things, finding that apparently a lot of their family had a ha had a helping hand in the production. So like, Glenn's family lended out their camp, Emily's brother helped build things, Jesse's sister voice acts Monokuma, etc. Oh, also, Jesse and Victor are missing from this search? That's weird. Oh, never mind, Jesse's back and apparently he's called a bus. Yeah, he says he's contacted help and that they all need to go hide from Victor. Okay, strange. He takes them into the literal masterminds lair, which is different from the mascot lair, and the group continue to snoop around in there. 
finding forums for the actual Danganronpa series and fan sites talking about Danganronpa V4. Victor and Monokuma find the group because they're hiding in the literal most obvious place, so v Victor, Jesse, and Monokuma slash Jesse's sister argue. Turns out Jesse's the traitor. Ignoring that, Victor shoots him in the head for calling a bus, so the three go run and hide in a cabin. Victor comes over to the cabin and torments them, still having the gun, and they'll have a little mini mastermind trial, like in that tiny little cabin. So to explain the lore, in this universe, Danganronpa is an obscure, really old anime. Basically, Victor finds it and is like, holy shit, I love this, so he wants to start his own. Victor literally wants to make his own fangan, except he wants it to be real death, because he's a obnoxious fangan child. Knowing this would not fly legally and no one would sign up for a death game, he just advertises it as a normal like game show acting gig, basically luring people in for his shitty IRL fangan. He wants to take part in it too though, and get the authentic experience, so he erases his memory completely. Because it can't really run without someone ensuring everything goes smoothly, he gets the most respectable dude he knows to do to know the truth and keep everything running. Jesse. Jesse literally cared about nothing, so when Victor came to him about this, he was like, sure, whatever, I don't give a shit. After the events of the killing game go down, though, he heavily regrets this and wants to end it, gaining a new appreciation for life. So after getting all that down in the fake trial, the bus finally arrives. Kim, Harmony, and Julian all know they need to escape, but Victor has a gun, so it's like, tough. Eventually, Julian tells the two that he'll do the, take the most dangerous position and try to fight the gun off him, while the two either run or help him out. They actually do this, and Kim stabs that bitch in the neck as Julian tries to fight him. Julian is unfortunately shot during this though and dies. Harmony did nothing the entire time. After a sad slow bleeding out scene of course, now covered in Victor's blood, Kim and Harmony walk to the bus and uh, bus all traumatized and get on, leaving the camp as our two only survivors. By the way, I know now is not the time to mention this, but I'm like... I'm reading the script, it's like 2 in the morning right now because I, as I said earlier, I started this way too late and I'm talking fast. Get the fuck over it, bitch. Deal with it. Don't bully me in the comments. Don't bully- So that was a weird ass chapter 6. Uh, it's kind of fun. Um, I bet no one expected Harmony to survive though. Uh, it's kind of iconic. Love that. Kim and Harmony. Julian dying for no fucking reason. So overall, yeah, um, I'll give my opinions on each chapter now, just like a little small section for this. Chapter 3 was weird, and but it had a lot of potential with the storm thing. If I were to actually like fully write that out, I think I would have adored it. Um, chapter 4 is so bad, it's embarrassing. We're gonna pretend chapter 4 didn't exist. Chapter 5 is 2. Um, it's probably worse, actually. And Shinatsu dies for no reason, similarly to Julian. They can twin on that. And then chapter 6 is just silly shit. The goofiest chapter 6 of all time. They're running around all crazy, stabbing each other. Like, calm down, god, talk. Have a, have a nice conversation. Actually, I did because, like, they did a whole trial for some reason to recount- Victor was like, You should recount the lore to me, Kim. That sounds fun, right? And with that, it's finally over. Rocky Restarts is fully dead. Thank goodness. Hallelujah. Merry Christmas. Happy Holidays. Oh, did you see that? What was that? Did- Seems like we have a fangin tip. Uh, probably a shitty thing. Please don't hire VAs immediately. Seriously, like, hiring VAs super early will mean that they'll likely be left with a long stretch of having nothing to work on and just being in your empty fangin. In my opinion, I, I mean, you don't have to listen, but I think you should wait until you absolutely need them so you can actually give them work. It's fun to get voices for your characters early. Like, don't get me wrong, we all want to have our, like, we want to know about that about our characters, but it's not fun when they have to leave between parts because you casted them three years ago and you're only now releasing episode two of your prologue. VAs will ine they'll likely inevitably need to leave because life happens and fangs take a long time to make. 
So it's better to have the work you need for them ready as soon as you cast, and plan for the long term. And remember, not doing VAs is always an option too. The VA community is wonderful and they deserve projects to be in, but if managing VA sounds too stressful, which it can definitely be, and the uncertainty of whether they'll stay or not long term too worrying, no it's not a requirement at all. So yeah, um, thanks for watching I guess. I really hope you don't come out of this video like, wow, Eternal Endings is gonna suck ass with this storyline, holy, uh, no it's not, I'm a better writer now, I'm actually confident in my writing, I think, personally, and what you're reading, what, or what I read out today and what you might read in the Google Doc, that is all when I was like a 15 year old Yonder a Simulator fan, no offense. I'm still, uh, I'm not getting into that. We have to do something and we have to do it now. Who's that? I was just an obnoxious little child and now I'm barely older, but I have a like um, superiority complex over my youngest, like time is weird. So yeah, happy holidays. Read the Google doc if you want more information, unless you've already read it. Um, thanks for the ad money. Goodbye.